Today, I am going to be teaching on something that I should probably talk about once a year, um, just the importance of and uh, stress, um, what it means to us as followers of Christ. And so today, I'm going to be talking about the Word of God, its, um, its importance to us, why we should still anchor ourselves to it. And as you guys know, the, the Word of God has been under fire for a while, and I just think it's, it's good for us to occasionally revisit uh, the reason as, as to why we still delve into it and make it the authority in our, our lives. The culture has certainly taken a shift. Um, we started to see this around the 1980s. And the authority of Jesus for the very first time began to be questioned. And so now that that's been going on for 40 years now, um, for some of you that's, that's a hard swallow when you think about the 1980s was 40 years ago, but it was. And um, so I want to just talk out today the importance of Scripture. And before I do, I just want to pray over this today and give God thanks. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for the people of God. Thank you for our church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence, the opportunity we've had to worship you this morning, and we'll continue to do that. And so, God, I pray as we talk out this incredible topic of your word today, that this would fall into uh, the soil of our soul and would refresh us. And God, if there's anyone in the building today who just needs redirection and guidance and wisdom and clarity in their life, that they will know full well by the end of this that it is still found in the Word of God. And so we thank you for that. We give you the praise. We tune in to your Holy Spirit today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Listen, the way that we teach the Bible here, if you're new to us, um, we kind of have a, a threefold pattern, if you will, of how we look at Scripture. Um, I've been saying this for about a decade now um, in how, how we uh, uh, profess and teach the Word of God, and that is these three things. We want to lead you first to a chapter and verse. So if we can, we want to give your situation or your question specifically a chapter and verse, okay? So we want to be able to say, it says in Romans 3, 23, this, or it says in Hebrews 2 and 10, this. And we want to be able to lead you to a specific chapter and verse. Sometimes it's not that clean. So then what, what, what we do is the second phase of that, and we will teach you from a biblical principle. So we, we will say, you know, that may not have a distinct chapter and verse, but there are themes throughout Scripture that give us principle, and we can teach that principle based upon the storylines of Scripture. So if we can't give you chapter and verse, we're going to give you principle. After that is the last thing, and that's my opinion. Okay, and but I, I will tell you before I give it to you. Okay, so it's like, hey, I can't find a chapter and verse, and we're struggling with a principle here. But I'll tell you what I think about it. But it is certainly Kevinology. Okay, it has nothing to do um, with with proper theology. But I want to talk out a few things this morning um, that if if I were were looking at Scripture for the first time struggling with it, had something going on in my life where I was being challenged with the authority of Scripture that I would want to know. And so I want to talk about some things in Scripture and what do we really know about the Bible. Well, the first thing is this. We know that a lot of things are not really in there that people say are in there and maybe that you've been taught are in there. And so I want to talk about a few of those Man, when I got into this, um, there were pages and pages of, of uh, clues and hints about things that we've said are in Scripture that are not, and we've just tried to pull them in and say, yeah, Paul said that, or John said that, or Jesus said that, but the first one is the one that we always get wrong, and we, we say that money is the root of all evil, and that is not true. 
Okay, money can be a great thing. It can be something that resources vision, takes care of people, fuels needs, fuels missions trips, plants churches, uh, clothes people, shelters people, meets a huge need in a, a community. Money fuels those things. Money gives you your lifestyle. Money gives you your shelter. Uh, money lets you provide, and those things are biblical. Being a provider for your family is a biblical thing, and you pursuing that to do good things with it is a noble thing. Money is not evil. The love of money is what's evil. Okay, When I shift my love from kingdom things, when I'm seeking God's kingdom second rather than first, and the love of money takes on a position of idolatry in my life, that is when that comes into play in Scripture. So that is 1 Timothy 6 and 10, the love of money. But it does not say money is the root of all evil. That is incorrect. The second thing that people say is in Scripture a lot is the Lord works in mysterious ways. How many of y'all have ever heard somebody say that? And they attribute that to Jesus or John or Paul or whatnot. Oh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. That is actually a poem written by William Cowper in the 1700s. Romans 11.33 says, How unfathomable are his ways, but it does not say that the Lord works in mysterious ways. Okay, So that may even be like a life principle that you've come up with, but uh, when you teach that under a theological grid, there is nothing that is a mystery unto God. And so it may be mysterious to you and I. We, we may look at something and go, I don't know how that's going down, how that's going to work. But Scripture does not tell us that the Lord works in mysterious ways. Here's a, another one. That God helps those who help themselves. Okay, We say, well, that's got to be in the Bible, right? It's actually not. It was one of Aesop's fables. Benjamin Franklin repeated it in the Poor Richard's Almanac. But it is not in Scripture. God helps those who help themselves. Here's one that a lot of parents use and say that this is in the Word. Cleanliness is next to godliness. So we say, if you want to be like Jesus, you better clean your room. Because he said it. He told his disciples, clean this place up. Okay, cleanliness is next to godliness. That is not true. That is from a 1778 sermon um, preached by John Wesley, Okay. Great communicator, great pastor, great evangelist, great church planner, but uh, he did not write scripture, and so that's not in there. Spare the rod, spoil the child is not in there, okay? Now, there is a close, very close scripture in Proverbs 13, 24 that says, he who withholds the rod hates his son, but it does not say spare the rod, spoil the child. That's where, where we've made it up. Here, here's, here's a good one. This too shall pass. Okay? We think that's in Scripture, but it's not. Okay? That is actually an Abraham Lincoln speech. Okay? So he got up and said, This too is going to pass. And somewhere we made uh, Honest Abe into the Apostle Paul. <laughs> the lion will lie down with the lamb. It's not in there. Isaiah 11 6 says, the wolf will live with a lamb, the leopard will lie down with a goat, and a little child will lead them. But a lion laying next to a lamb is something that we've made up. Seven deadly sins, not in there. Okay, There's actually more than seven, um, but there's not listed out seven. Proverbs 6 tells us there are six things that the Lord hates, seven which are detestable unto him, but there are not seven dead, deadly sins. Here's one that we always hear about. The three wise men, they are not in there, okay? Um, I know that breaks your heart. If your kids are here, put your finger in their ear. Um, but we do not know. There's no recording of the number of kings or magistrates that came to see uh, Christ at the birthplace. Um, but we just know that there were three gifts given. And so we attribute that to three different people. It could have been one person uh, bringing a great big bag of gifts uh, it could have been two people bringing three gifts. It could have been six people bringing three gifts. Um, and they all went in together on purchasing three together. I don't know. Uh, but there was no uh, recording of three wise men uh, showing up, okay? So we know that we attribute a lot of things to Scripture that are not in there. 
And so it's very important that we as believers know what, what we're talking about and as we get into the word that we know what we're feeding our soul and what we're claiming to be truth and what we're saying is the authority in our lives, that needs to be a baseline of truth that it's actually in this book. The second thing is that we know that it is a major, major literary work, okay? And so when we look at scripture, there's got to be some appreciation for it and value for it just as a major literary work, that this is a, a cross-examined and a cross-sectioned book that you can look from Genesis and see type and shadow all the way through to Revelation and then look at the rearview mirror of Rev- Revelation and see all the way back to, to Genesis. Many say this is not a separate book. It is one conclusive book and storyline that went on together that you and I have access to. But I'm going to give you some stats here. Some of these you may have never heard before, but I can tell you no matter how many times I read this right right here, it's always mind-blowing to me to see, again, the major literary work that we have access to. So there are 66 total books in the Word of God, 1,189 chapters, 31,000 verses, 780,000 plus words, 1,200 promises, 6,000 commands, 8,000 prophecies, most of which have been fulfilled. There are 3,000 plus questions asked in this book. Adam, where are you? Am I my brother's keeper? Who will go for us? Who do you say that I am? What must I do to be saved? If God is for us, who can be against us? And on and on and on. Most of them are rhetorical in nature to engage God's people, to say, is anything too hard for God? Um, It's this engagement, it's this invitation to join the conversation. So there are 3,000 of those. There were 40 authors over a 1,500-year period. 30 writers in the Old Testament, 10 in the New Testament. This book has been translated into 1,200 languages. This is going to surprise you, but chapters were not introduced until 1238 A.D. by the Catholic Church. So when Paul was writing, he did not write chapter 1, verse 1, and write that out. He wrote it as a letter. The Catholic Church came along and said, let us organize it. If we're going to teach from it, if we're going to draw truth from it, then let's break it up, and that way anyone who's being taught can find what what we're talking about. So in the 1200s, they wrote chapters. Verses were added, again, by the Catholic Church 313 years later. So then we had chapter and verse. You had, for the very first time in 1551, you had the ability to tell someone to turn to John 316, and they could find it in 1551. So the Old Testament is a combination of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, and the Greek Bible called the Septuagint. The New Testament was written by Jewish disciples in Greek, and yet the printing press was not invented until 1440. So the reason I bring this up is because I want us to get this information in us that many, many people, served Christ, lived for God, loved God, gave their lives to God, even martyred for God without having a personal copy of Scripture. So they had this story in them. It was part of them. They were taught the Word of God, and faith came by hearing. And so as they were taught, their faith was stirred. And they gave their hearts to Christ and they lived for him. And they planted churches. And they lived life together. And they were full of the Spirit. And none of them had a copy of this. I want you to think about that. Because I think sometimes in our westernized mind, we think that everyone had this convenience and they did not. So think about the New Testament church. As things were happening as 
as power began to fill them, as their lives were changed, they were leaning into what they had heard, what they had buried in their heart, and none of them in any home had a copy of this. It's a complete luxury that you and I get to have this in our hand. That we now get to take a highlighter and, and highlight and make notes and say, this is what is speaking to me and cross-reference that and, and create your own journal within, within the pages of this scripture. It's a complete luxury. One time I was talking with a missionary friend and he was saying that he had gone to this remote area. I don't even remember where it was. I was, a, I was a young teen when I was talking to him and he said, the surprise was this, is that there was a missionary who had gone before him and he had taken a Bible and most of what he was taking to this particular group of people had been confiscated. And he made it in with one paper Bible. It, it wasn't leather bound. It wasn't beautiful. It was just a small uh, paper Bible. Most of it just the New Testament was left. And so the children were asking for pages of it. So he was tearing out pages and handing it to the uh, children. And he said, and I showed up and it was like 20 years later. And this little girl pulled this piece of paper out of her shoe. And unfolded it and said, I've had this for, for 20 years. The missionary before you gave me this page of scripture and I've read it. And he, he said she could just recite it, the, the front and the back page together. That's all that she had. That's all that she knew was this one page. And she had had it for 20 years, just that one page of scripture. And it, stuff like that floors me sometimes because I think we forget how incredible it is to have something like this in our hands. And so in 1440, the printing press was created, and the first English translation of Scripture was a New Testament only. It was printed in 1526. And then 85 years later, in 1611, the King James Version came out. So I always pause to tell people this. Paul did not preach from a King James Version Bible. Okay? And John didn't either, and any, anybody else. All right, so the King James was printed in 1611. There were 168,000 Bibles sold now. version has downloaded millions upon millions upon millions of copies of Scripture, putting it digitally into the hands of people around the world. The Bible read nonstop can be completed in approximately 70 hours. Okay, I don't know if you guys recall this, but a few years ago, Harding did this on the steps of the Benson. And I would have hated to have been that kid at 3 a.m. shift reading from Malachi. You know, nobody's around, and he's out there staring at the tank, the baptismal fountain, and he's just reading from Malachi by himself, thinking, why didn't I take the 8 a.m. shift where I got Matthew and, you know, something, something better than this? But they read it in, in, in under 70 hours. It's just something fun and interesting for them to do. But again, we forget the magnitude of what put this together for us. Of how blessed a people we are to have what, what we've found. To what, what we know exists and to have it in our hands and on our iPads and on our phones and anywhere else that we want it. We are just surrounded and, and can be daily just inundated with the Word of God. It's just amazing. Let me dig into this for a minute. We also know that we don't have the whole story. And I don't, I don't want this to bother you, but it's true. We don't have the entire story. And I've said this many times before because I want you to get an idea, okay? This Bible is also that I have in my hand is also a study Bible. So if you, you know, it's pretty thick. And so if you took out the study elements of this Bible, it would be thinner than this. And this is an old man's Bible. This is extra large print. And so, you know, you've got to think, you know, and I still can't read it. I'm leaning in like this. <laughs> so you have to think about the thickness of this. And I want you to think about every book that we have or every story we have just on U.S. history. And think about how we could fill this room up with the authorship and information and storyline of U.S. history, all the things that happened, all the president stories and all the people that were close and all the battles fought and all, all the rooms and the meetings and the, the, the geography and all just the entire storyline. 
And we, we would have book upon book upon book upon book, but this is all we have to tell us about the creation of the world to the end of it. We're, we're getting a snippet of the love story of God just enough that you and I look at it and we go, I see myself in that story. We have a very small picture. Let me tell you why I, th I think this way. Because the people who wrote these books had endless material to choose from. There were countless stories to be shared, centuries of history handed down, massive amounts of information to include or not include. In the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, the author says in chapter 11, as for the other events of Solomon's reign and all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And we say, well, I guess they are, but we don't have the book of the Acts of Solomon. We have Song of Solomon. Many theologians believe that this book that they're referencing here in 1 Kings chapter 11 may have been lost during exile to Babylon. That during that whole transition when many things and many artifacts went, went missing, that this nugget of information, this second wisdom book, was gone. Maybe destroyed or hidden to never be found again. We see something similar in the Gospel of John where he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. So he's saying there are things that are happening that we didn't even write down. Many things that were left out. The book ends with this. He says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose, he says, that even the world would not have room for the books to be written. This is what life with Jesus was like. Everything he said, every word he said, you wanted to cling to. Think of all the questions that they asked of him in private times, private meetings. Lord, teach us about this. Tell us about this. Think of the ways he emptied himself to them that were not written down. Makes me mad at them. There are things that we don't know that, man, I wish we knew. Stories that were not included that I wish we had, but we don't. And he clearly says it. We did not write them down. They were not recorded. It's as if the writer, just to wrap things up, says, oh yeah, I left a ton of stuff out, right? The authors of the books of the Bible were not just writing. They were selecting and editing and choosing and making decisions about the material and the content to extend to other generations or not to extend. The writer of the Gospel of Luke, all of these people wrote according to their purpose. They had a, a reason for writing. Luke says, I too decided to write an account for you. Meaning this, I saw some things, I wanted you to have it, I'm writing it down so that you can read it. Man, I hope this finds its way somewhere. They had no idea that they were writing scripture. Esther started to write, and she said, this is what happened. She wanted us to know. Toward the end of the Gospel of John, John says, this I write to you that you may believe. That you may hear what I say that you may trust something that I saw in him and that you too might believe because of my story. So we have in our hands a collection of passionate writings of people whose lives were impacted by serving and observing and living life right next to Jesus. Next, we know that there are contradictions. Or are there? And I want to get into this for just a minute because this is where this little spinoff came in the 80s was people going, well, it's full of contradictions. 
And if it's going to contradict itself, then how do we, know, how do we believe from the Old Testament to the New? Or how do, how do we differentiate between John the Beloved and James the brother of Jesus? Because their two stories don't line up. This is supposed to be the exact same story. Exact, no, that's not how all, all, all that works. So let me dive, dive into that. Let me begin by saying that not everyone who says the Bible contains a contradiction is an angry, card-carrying atheist. Okay, People are able to say there's a contradiction there. And not everyone who believes that there are not contradiction is backwoods or unscientific or a fundamentalist with their head in the sand. All right? So it's important to distinguish the difference between a contradiction and an and actual difference of perspective. So just because you have two passages in here that seem to be different does not mean that there's a contradiction. Now, the one that I like to point out the most, and because it's easier, but it brings home this point, is this. In Matthew 27 and 5, the Bible says that Judas hung himself. However, in Acts 1.18, it says that he fell to the ground and burst wide open. Okay? And I know that you're like, why did you choose that one? Okay? But... These are two different perspectives of Judas' death, but they are not a formal contradiction. A formal contradiction would be that Matthew says Judas hung himself, and Acts says he was not hung, he was stoned. Okay, That would be a formal contradiction. Because hanging yourself and falling to the ground and bursting wide open is two different perspectives and could very well be the same attempt. Okay, let me explain that. Again, this is the PG-13 version. Judas hung himself. You give that body hanging there a few days and it will fall to the ground and burst wide open. It could be the same perspective given four, five, six days apart. It could also be that Judas hung himself, branch broke, fell to the ground, burst open. We don't know the geography. We don't know, was he hanging over a cliff? We don't know if the rope broke. He got upset, climbed a cliff, jumped off the cliff. The point is, Judas is dead. Right? Right? And people are like, I'm not going to serve God because there's a contradiction there. It does not matter. (laughs) Judas is dead. Jesus was dead and rose again. That's the point. (laughs) So don't get hung up on a formal contradiction because there's not one. Keep in mind that people wrote these accounts. All right? The only time, or there are two times, that we got distinct authorship from God was the Ten Commandments handed directly to Moses and when he wrote on the wall to King Belshazzar. That's it. Everything else was done through people. So the point is that these are different versions of the same story. We should respect, enjoy, Celebrate the diversity of Scripture, not try to iron everything out so, so neatly. This is one reason why we became so quickly separated with denominations because they said, no, 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 this has got to be perfect. It's got to be ironed out. And the story of Christianity is not perfect. It's ugly in some ways. It's bloody in other ways. It is just, there is is torment in in a lot of different ways. All All these early believers, most of them gave their lives and martyrdom in ways that were terrible. It's not cute, and it's not pretty, and and you can't iron it out straight. It's our job to just go, man, I was loved. And I just want to be part. Of that story. So, if God wanted it done neatly or wanted to give us one account of Jesus, He would have handed it to us rather than use us to get it out. So, how do I want to end this today? Is is simple. 
This doesn't have one of those big pointed, let's bow our heads and and raise a hand. What I want to challenge us to do is to make sure you are getting word in your life. If you are only getting word right here one hour a week, it's not enough. It's not enough. And so I will give you these three application steps. Read, meditate, apply. Read, meditate, apply. Every year, there's a lot of you that say, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this Bible in a, in a year. And you do great until you hit Lamentations. And then you're done. Okay? Some of you have never made it to Lamentations chapter 4. You stop, you give up. So here's what I, I would say. This is not about quantity. It's about quality time with the Word. You treat it as a relationship, not as a task list. If you start looking at this as something to just check off, it gets boring really fast. What you do is you treat it as a conversation. And you you find some time that you dedicate to God as holy and sacred and separate, and you just read it. And I think some days you're going to read one verse. I've told you this before. I have a practice in my own life where many days for me, it's one verse. And I will take because I'm, I'm always studying and prepping because I'm always teaching somewhere and in some format. But for my personal life, it's one verse. And I'll take that one verse and think about it all day. And I'll write it down. I'll stick a post-it on my desk. And I'll, I'll just I'll think about it and think about it and think about it. And I'll chew on it for the day. And how does that apply? And I'll let it run its course through my thought life and, and, and through situations. or what. I'll have that, that one verse. Other days, it's a chapter. Some days it's Old Testament. Some days it's New Testament. It doesn't matter to me because it's, it's just me getting word into my life. I'm not going, okay, I did an Old Testament, I did a New Testament, I did a Psalm and a Proverb. And if that works for you, great. But if it doesn't, don't feel shamed. So make it yours. Kevin, does it matter if it's a, a paper version or a digital version? No. And again, we almost make that silly. It's the same word. If you're a digital person, download the Bible. If you're a paper person, man, go nerdy on this thing. Get you some markers and and pens and post-its and go crazy. However you want to get it in you. Find a version you like. Kevin, dad taught us that the King James Version was the only version. Well, your dad was wrong. (laughs) Find a version you like. Find a version that speaks to you. Find something that, man, you can, oh, man, you're biting into it. You're getting it in you. And then meditate. Ask questions of the Lord. I was taught that growing up, that if you had a question, it was illustrating a lack of faith. That's wrong, too. If you have questions, you're seeking. You're trying to find. You're searching, right? So ask. Write those things down. Pursue them with God. Let Him lead you to another verse, to another verse, to another verse. Meditate on it. Repeat it. Sing it. Memorize it. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your refrigerator. Get it in you. So read it, meditate on it, and apply it. Now listen, the work on the cross was perfect, but you are not. Do not shoot for for perfection. Shoot for progress. So if you're able to say, man, I'm getting more word in me right now than I ever have in my life, that's progress. That doesn't mean that you've read all 780,000 words, but it's progress. You're moving toward it. You are applying it. The goal is to become more like Christ. Enjoy the journey. Let it be a beautiful experience for you. Let it be life-giving for you. Don't let, again, this become something that is a task list that is arduous and feels heavy to you. 
Enjoy the journey. Let me end with this verse and I'm going to pray. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says this. All scripture, I love this word, is God breathed. This is the same word, God breathed, that says when God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. The same breath that entered you spoke scripture. This word is theonoustos. It means the exhalation of God. Okay, so God is, is breathing, he's exhaling. He has spoken this word unto you. The same word that was spoken into us and we became alive and that something in us became eternal. Same word, God's exhaling. It says it is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Watch, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every Good work. If you want to know how to do something good with your life, it's here. If you want to know the answer to your life, it's here. If you want to know how to parent your children, it's here. If you want to know how to turn a situation around, it's here. If you want to know how to be wise, it's here. This is Theonoustos. It's the breath of God. And we need it in our lives. And so I pray today that we get a hunger for this word and we come back to it and we say, Lord, teach me again how to love the word. Teach me again how to put this as the authoritarian over my life and my marriage and my parenting and my, my career. Let me follow the word of God. It is a luxury. And we have it right here in our hands. Let's drink from the cup we've been given. Amen.